Hello everyone, Ben Woodruff here with another Falconry video. Today's video, I'm going to be talking about picking your first occipiter. Now, we're talking about uh, if you haven't flown an occipiter before, and specifically presented with the choice of either flying a sharp-shinned hawk, Cooper's hawk, or a northern goshawk, which is our three native occipiters here in North America, which one of those is the best choice for you? Now, I'm making this video right now because it's spring, it's nesting season, and I've had a lot of people asking me to produce this video. So uh, again, keep sending me your suggestions. I will have more detailed videos on each of these species throughout the summer and fall on training, trapping, hunting, all those kind of things. But this is a good intro if you're making that choice. Now, as we get into this, there's one rule that uh, I always, I think is important to share, and that is generally, you will have the most success as a falconer if you choose a species of bird of prey that lives in your area, that's native to your area, and you train it to hunt prey that is native to your area, and if this is a, a prey species that this predator naturally hunts in the wild. That formula is a recipe for success, but that's not always how falconry works. You might have a species that you're passionate about, or maybe there's behavioral issues with one species, so you pick another. So uh, understanding that, uh, let's get into these three species. The first species is the sharp-shinned hawk our smallest occipiter in North America. Now this species should is called the sharp shinned hawk because apparently the leading edge of the shins are sharp. That's not a good field mark. That's not a notable thing. A red-tailed hawk has a vibrant red tail as an adult. It's very noticeable. Uh, really this species, the common name should be the American sparrow hawk because many parts of the world have a bird this size and shape that fills this ecological niche and this would be it's what it should be called. But sharp shinned hawk. This is a very small bird of prey, and it's a very delicate bird of prey, but it is so much fun to hunt. So, this species, you normally are hunting sparrows and starlings worth, or if you have a depredation permit, you can also use it to hunt blackbirds. It has a very high success rate of direct pursuit flight, and if it misses, it will get back up and keep going after its prey. Very high success rate. It can be used to hunt quail. I have never caught more quail with any other bird. I've never had such a high success rate with any other bird as with a sharp chin hawk. But one of the problems is they have long talons but very short toes. So when I say catch, I doesn't I don't mean that they were able to hold on. So they many times would grab onto a quail and the quail would get loose. They just aren't quite built to tackle quail. They'll catch them, but they have a hard time holding on. So this species, if you get it as an imprint and raise it from an imprint, and there's many uh, methods for properly training an imprint, but with sharp shin hawks, they're a very easy train. If With any of the birds I'm mentioning today, be sure to talk to somebody who's had experience with them. Uh, but as an imprint or trapped as a first year passage bird, both can be trained quite easily. An imprint sharp hawk will hunt and hunt and hunt all day long with no problem, will easily have no fear in the field of you or other people. They're a very good bird to work with. If you get trap a passage one, we generally have a rule that any sharp hawk trapped after September is uh, going to have fear issues that are difficult to overcome. And so it's better to get an imprint versus a sharp hawk after September typically. Not that it can't be done, but that's sort of the general rule. Now, the the trick to solving any behavioral issue with a sharp shinned hawk, the short answer is hunt. Just hunt, hunt, hunt all the time, and you'll have a blast with them. Now, these are very tiny birds, very delicate. If your equipment is too bulky, if your perch is incorrect, this could lead to injuries very quickly. Also, this is a bird that if you are off even slightly with your weight control and your weight management, the this can also cause major problems. I do not recommend you fly a sharp shin hawk unless you've previously flown either a Kestrel or a Merlin that has given you the experience to manage the weight of a micro bird. Uh, but this will probably be the most fun you'll ever have with a bird of prey. They're just, you, it's just nonstop fun, extremely high success rate. Even though it takes work to train them, catching things with a sharp shin is almost like shooting fish in a barrel. Because having that kind of a high success rate with that sort of athleticism uh, shown, how, how can you not have a great time? This is a very common species of raptor, but finding their nests can be a little bit tricky. And in a few weeks, I'll have a video up on how to find them in the American West, which is where I live. Uh, but 
still, whether you get a male or a female, you're going to have a great time and just make sure that you're religious about your weight management and understand if you're going after anything bigger than a sparrow, they may have a difficult time binding and holding on. And that's in part because the rump feathers of larger birds, quail and partridge, things like that, have extra layers of fluff for that purpose so that if a, an occipiter grabs them, all the fluff comes out and the bird gets away. The next bird we're gonna talk about is a Cooper's Hawk. A Cooper's Hawk is it is an amazing hunter. It's, it's probably my favorite hawk to fly. They're very common all over the United States and they're easily accessible both as a passage bird and as a baby from a nest, as an imprint. Um, and they're a very fun size. They're bigger than a sharp shinned hawk but smaller than a goshawk. And this is another species that will hunt and hunt and hunt all day long. But you would think because of that everybody would be hunting them but they don't. This is a tricky species to train. This, of our three occipiter choices, in my opinion, is the one that will hold grudges the most and is the easiest to accidentally mistrain in a way that they become aggressive or violent. So of these three occipiters, the Cooper's Hawk is more important than any of the others that you either your sponsor or, or that somebody with experience with this bird can help guide you through the nuances that will prevent you from getting grabbed in the face. The species itself is the perfect quail hawk. That's what you, I, when I hear say the word Cooper's hawk, bam, quail pops into my head. They are perfectly suited for hunting quail. Uh, I have hunted them on chuck or partridge, which is a little bit of a jump weight-wise for them, but they can definitely do it. Um, you can hunt ducks with them, meaning they can catch them, but it's kind of like a sharp hawk on a quail. If a Cooper's hawk goes after a duck, that's a lot of weight. That's a lot of duck wing flapping. They can get, you know, feathers damaged. So it's very rare for people to uh, do that. Some people will at the end of the season, right, when they're about to put their Cooper's hawk up for the molt, they'll, you know, catch a few ducks to build the bird's confidence and if a couple of feathers break it doesn't matter because in a month the bird's going to start growing in new feathers and it's all good but it, but cooper's hawks typically you're going after anything from a sparrow to a quail they can hunt doves um and uh, things like that pigeons they're able to catch so uh, very fast very flash and dash but again, one of the trickiest things is this is a bird that can hold a grudge very easily. So I say that Cooper's Hawk is the exact opposite of a beginner's entry level occipiter. It's much better to have flown a Goss or a Sharpshin first before you fly a Cooper's Hawk. Now the weight management is very delicate, just like a Sharpshin. So it's not wise to fly a Cooper's Hawk if you haven't already flown a Kestrel or a Merlin and are familiar with that minute weight management that's so crucial to success and health with, with small birds. Um, Cooper's Hawks can be imprinted and there's again very specific techniques. I'll have some videos on that later. But the best scenario in my opinion for a dream bird with a Cooper's Hawk is if you find a nest watch it observe it and watch the parents raising the babies and there's a point where the parents uh are are taking wounded birds bringing it near the nest and the babies are hungry and they start to fly and chase and pursue it's the week that the parents abandon the babies and leave them if you trap one of those birds right at that age right as the parents have abandoned them within a day or two of that time you will have a perfect bird the problems that can come with an imprint bird typically won't surface and you have a bird that's friendly and it's a normal progression oh mom and dad did this then they abandoned me then this human came along and we became a hunting team very quickly and you can shape them into a very successful very athletic bird with good manners uh, sometimes that's referred to as a family bird and that's true with all three of these birds but particularly with a cooper's hawk you're going to have a great bird if you can if you can find and achieve that age bird. And of the three, that's the easiest one to be able to do that with because Cooper's Hawk nests are everywhere. And if you watch, I posted a video, I think, last week in my falconry playlist on uh, finding Cooper's Hawk nests. So the last of the three choices of North American occipiters is, of course, the Northern Goshawk. These are, these are large birds. And when, when we say northern goshawk, that actually refers to the northern part of the northern hemisphere. They're a circumpolar species, but within that range of the northern part of the northern hemisphere, there's many subspecies, uh, including like the Siberian goshawk that's almost pure white. Uh, you've got 
the Finnish goshawk, which is enormous. You've got all these different subspecies, and they're distant enough from each other that different genetic uh, expressions have occurred. And it seems to be the case that the North American northern goshawk is arguably the smallest of all the subspecies and the most rascally, the most... Uh, the most uh, aggressive in its issues. In other words, the mentality as far as social nature and uh, getting along and forgiveness of European goshawks, Finnish goshawks, Russian goshawks seems much closer to that of a red-tailed hawk. They still have the speed and you still have to watch for the same mistakes uh, as you would with an American goshawk, but these these European goshawks, they just, uh, if you if you can get one, you're doing yourself a favor. They're they're easier to train and manage than North American goshawks. But I've flown a number of North American northern goshawks and love them. This uh, again, this is a bird that is more forgiving than a Cooper's hawk, and you'll have a very high success rate. Now you've got a broad range of game you can take. Anything literally from a sparrow to a duck or a goose. You can hunt full-size jackrabbits. I, even with males, which are smaller, I've been able to hunt full-size uh, black-tailed jackrabbits. So both for ground quarry and flighted quarry, a, a northern goshawk is an amazing bird. This is a bird that the vocalizations, if you imprint them in a way that they're wailing and are begging for food, the vocalizations will drive you crazy. So if you're thinking of flying an imprint goshawk, you would be wise to uh, talk to uh, experienced falconers who have flown them already and learn the best ways to social imprint them so that they're not squawking at you all the time. A passage goshawk, I don't think there is an age where you can trap a passage goshawk, a first year goshawk, that is gonna be a problem. Where I said with sharp shins after September, and eh, they kind of keep this fear. You could you could fly you could trap any goshawk that's still in its juvenile brown colors and still have it be a great falconry bird. But if you trap a passage goshawk, they are very prone to the uh, to the uh, disease aspergillosis. And the stress of being trapped, which isn't that stressful, but it's just enough that asper spores in the air can take root in their lungs and you can have a bird dead in a week. So if you trap a bird, a goshawk, then you're very wise to do everything you can to keep its stress level down. And I would also recommend wherever you have it housed to cut up pine needles. So the off-gassing of that, which is an antifungal, which I'll do another video on that, uh, but the antifungal properties will actually help kill asper spores in their throat and keep their stress level down. An imprint goshawk or a passage goshawk the trick is to hunt, hunt, hunt all you can. So if you're making a decision, if you have access between a goshawk and a sharp-shinned hawk, and you're trying to decide, is if you have access to both of those, in my mind, the question becomes, what quarry do I have? If I have lots of ducks and lots of rabbits, sure, get a goshawk. If it's like, well, occasionally I see a duck and we don't have rabbits in my area, but I got a lot of sparrows and starlings, we'll go with a sharp-shinned hawk. Um, that's, it's just, it's a no-brainer. And vice versa, if you, if you live in an area loaded with ducks, why wouldn't you fly a goshawk? So again, my opinion is, my experience has been that a Cooper's hawk is not a beginner's bird. It is the most advanced of these three birds, and it's not because of special training techniques, it's just because they're rigid and, 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 and unforgiving if you make a mistake. And again, for any of these birds, you're going to have a great time if you fly right as they've left their parents, or sorry, right as their parents have abandoned them. But particularly with the Cooper's Hawk, if you find a nest, keep your eye on it. And right when the week that the parents leave, if you catch a bird at that age, you're going to have a dynamite hunting Cooper's Hawk that has the most minimal aggression of any scenario you could play out with a Cooper's Hawk. So I hope these details help a little bit if you're deciding on an occipiter. Uh, feel free to ask any questions down below. Uh, this was just a quick video, and I will have more detailed videos about occipiters in the coming weeks and months. But uh, thank you for subscribing to my channel. Check out my falconry video playlist, and as always, happy hawking. <laughs>